chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We've looked at this book for a few weeks now. We come now to the final chapter of 1 John. Looking at the fifth chapter, and today we'll look at the first 12 verses. We'll, we'll take the chapter in two parts. We'll finish the book next Lord's Day, Lord willing. Today we'll look at the first 12 verses. Now, as I read these, uh, depending on the translation that you use, when I come to verses 7 and 8, uh, your reading may be a little bit longer than the reading that I will do uh, from the translation that I'm using. And if that raises any questions in your mind, when we come to that part of the text, uh, we'll speak to why that is, why we sometimes have these differences. For now, let's read the text, verses 1 through 12 of 1 John chapter 5. This is the word of the Lord. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. Verse 9, we accept human testimony... But God's testimony is greater, because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar, because they have not believed the testimony that God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, again, we ask for the Spirit of God to enlighten us and to make us to understand this word and to love it, to, for our affections to be uh, renewed and refreshed and oriented toward God and Christ by the reading and the preaching of the word. Increase our faith, increase our insurance, increase our love for you in obedience to you. We we'll give you our thanks for what you do by means of your spirit through the word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are pleased to welcome back to our assembly this morning, by the way, Tim and Allison Nelson and their three children. Glad that they are with us today. They're back from the state of Michigan and Mackinac City. And if you're familiar with where they went, you know that in Mackinac City, you have a large bridge called the Mackinac Bridge, and it connects the upper and the lower peninsulas of Michigan. It's about a half mile long, so once you get out on the bridge, you can be pretty far from shore. Now, I don't know if you guys cross it or get nervous when you do, but I worked for a pastor who grew up in Michigan, and he had a girl in his youth group that was terrified to drive across the Mackinac Bridge. She may have done this with all bridges, but especially for this one, if they would go on youth outings and be in the van, she would, she would curl up and get in the floor of the van and put her hands over her ears when she went across the bridge. A great anxiety, terrified to cross this bridge. She felt she wasn't safe. Now, nothing ever happened, thank the Lord. There, there have been very few incidents connected with the bridge at all in its history. It's never collapsed or had a problem like that. She was safe despite her fears. Now, you compare that with what happened in Minneapolis in August of 2007. During rush hour, as thousands of cars drove home from work, the I-35 West Bridge, which spans the Mississippi River, suddenly collapsed, and several cars plummeted to the water below. Uh, sadly, 13 people died in the Minneapolis Bridge collapse. Now, there, there is a certain irony, is it not, that the young lady from Michigan was terrified to cross the bridge, 
And yet the bridge held her. It kept her safe. It it never failed. And at the same time, those folks driving home in Minnesota, they they had no concept, no idea that this bridge was suddenly going to collapse. Regardless of how the people felt, one bridge was safe and the other was not. Now, last week, we looked at John's admonition. Chapter 4, verse 1. Do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. And we talked about how John pointed out that the false teachers in his day, they appealed to the spirit. They were religious. In their mind, that they were not leaving Christianity by leaving John's church by any stretch of the imagination. They appealed to the spirit. But John warned his congregation. That appeal in and of itself didn't guarantee the truth of their message. Merely taking the name Christian and appealing to the Spirit didn't mean that they were right. They were probably sincere. And many of the people who followed them were sincere. But they were sincerely wrong. And much like these two bridges, regardless of how the people felt, one was safe, the other was not. And John has been making the point throughout his book that there's a version of Christianity that is safe and true. There's a version of it that is not. And your sincerity doesn't determine which is right and wrong, but the truth of the matter. Now, I've said also last week that that when John writes, he's like an airplane circling the landing strip. He's getting closer and closer to his destination with each pass. He he goes over his topics, and and sometimes he, he descends a little deeper as he revisits several topics along the way. Well, we've come to chapter five. John's ready to land the plane. So he's going to make one more pass over his main message. And then he's going to come a little deeper into one of his topics. What he's going to do is he's going to look at his main ideas. What is Christianity all about? And then he's going to go a little deeper into this idea of our faith's object. What is it that you believe in? Not do you believe, but what is it that you believe in? So we can break up this passage into two parts. The the focus on faith. Faith and its fruits, verses 1 through 5, and then the importance of faith's object. What is it we believe in, verses 6 through 11. Let's look at those two sections together today. First, in verses 1 through 5, John's going to highlight the importance of faith and its fruits, the fact that we have faith and how that faith expresses itself. And what he's going to do here is he's really going to summarize the book in verses 1 through 5. So if you're ever doing a Bible study on 1 John, you want to take people to a, to a central passage. What is this book all about? Verses 1 through 5 will serve you well. Here's the question. What does it mean to be born again? What are the main characteristics of a Christian? John gives three. Belief in Jesus as the Christ, love for God and one another, in obedience to God's commands. Let's look at them in that order. First half of verse 1 reads, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. John goes right to his theme here of assurance. How do I know that I am born of God? Because I believe that Jesus is the Christ. It's a certain irony, isn't it, that faith is a condition for salvation? Believe in Jesus and you will be saved. It's something you have to do in order to be saved. And yet at the same time, faith is the evidence of salvation. How do I know that God has brought me to life spiritually? How do I know that I am born of God? Because I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We talk about faith being the result of God making us spiritually alive. And John emphasizes that here. I think, by the way, that John's statement... Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is a good key for directing us on how we might share the gospel with children. Sometimes children show, oftentimes in fact, if they're being raised in the faith, they'll show an interest in spiritual things. They'll they'll start to show some comprehension. And they might ask you, okay, well, am I going to heaven? Am I a believer? How do I know that I'm going to go to heaven when I die? How does John present it? What do you believe, he asks. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Because if you do, then you have eternal life. And I think that's a good way to to address it with younger minds. Show them the promises of God. Ask them if they believe them. Assure them then of what God has said about those who believe that we have eternal life. Sometimes we, we get focused on having them pray a prayer. And I won't criticize it because they want to express their faith. 
They want to cry out to God and ask him to save them. That's legitimate. But John gets to the heart of the matter and says, it's all about what we believe. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? If you do, God's promise is you have eternal life. Focusing our attention, not on what we do and what we pray, but on what we believe in. In fact, notice that language. The one who believes that Jesus is the Christ. Compare it with verse 5. The one who believes that Jesus is is the Son of God. Those two titles, Christ and Son of God, that they overlap very heavily in John. They're not the exact same thing. Christ has a focus on what Jesus does to save you. He's the anointed one, the perfect prophet, the perfect priest, the perfect king. Son of God focuses a little bit more on who Jesus is, the one who comes from God, God himself, sharing the nature of God, but yet distinct from God. John puts both of them in front of us and says, do you believe that Jesus is those things? The one who came to save you, God himself in human flesh, focusing already on faith. Do you believe? And faith's object. What is it that you believe in? Second, so that's one of the main themes of what it means to be a Christian. Second, John transitions very naturally to our love. A thing we've already seen often in his book, the love that flows from our faith. Look at the end of verse 1. He says, everyone who loves the father loves his child as well. So follow John's logic here. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, then you are born of God. If you are born of God, then you will love him. If you love the father, then you will love everyone else. Who is born of God? John's point is we don't have alienated siblings in the family of God. Brothers and sisters from whom we are separated and never speak to because there's so much animosity between the true parties. We love God, so we love all of God's other children as well. We are in the same family. So much so that that, that when there is that animosity, John says, okay, are one or both parties members of this divine family? And notice also verse 2. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. Now, that seems a little backwards from what you're used to, but here's what I think John is doing here. You see that this at the beginning of verse 2? He's probably referring back to the principle that he just mentioned at the end of verse 1. Here's how I'd summarize it. By this principle, namely... The principle that we must love our father's children. That is how we know that we ought to love the children of God whenever we love God and keep his commands. You see what John is saying? As you love God, as you keep his commands, well, so you must also love one another. They all go together in one package and you can't take one ingredient out without ruining the whole thing. And then finally, thirdly, John talks about the necessity of Christian obedience. So notice what he says there in verse 2, loving God, carrying out his commands. Notice how he connects those two ideas in verse 3. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. The word burdensome there, it means a, a source of difficulty or trouble because of the demands made. In other words, it's a burden because there's so much, there's so many demands and, and technicalities you can't keep it. Think of the American legal or tax code. It's a burden because there's just so much detail. How do you know when you're actually doing the right thing? Well, John says Jesus' commands aren't like that. They're not difficult. They're not difficult in their demands. Now, you say, if you're an astute reader, you think, wait a minute, Jesus demands some very difficult things. Read the Sermon on the Mount. How can you say that Jesus' commands aren't difficult? A couple things. First, I do think John has in mind very particular commands here. The commands of faith and love. So he's not getting at every single command. He's talking about faith and love, as he said back in chapter 3, verse 23. Second, Jesus' commands don't burden us with legalistic, man-made tradition and minutia. He says in Matthew 11, Jesus himself, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Remember, the Pharisees bound heavy commandments on God's people, and they didn't didn't lift a finger to help them obey him. And And if that is the kind of commands from Christ that you've been presented with, it's coming from a compromised form of Christianity. Jesus says he has a, is a, a easy yoke. His burden is light. There is refreshment in knowing him. But third, and I think this is the main idea, John says they're not burdensome. Why? Because God has done something on the inside of us to change how we feel about God's law and how we obey it. Look at verse 4. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is where John's starting to circle back to the top. Why aren't God's commands burdensome? Because you've been born of God. You've overcome the world. The spirit of God, not the spirit of the world and of Antichrist, the spirit of God has brought you to new life. And so you can believe in Jesus, love one another, and obey God's commands. And look at how John summarizes the whole thing at the end of verse 4. He says, this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. And the word victory there, it's a great word. It, It often refers in other Greek literature to the Roman emperor's power that granted him authority. How how did the Roman emperor win wars? How did he govern his empire? He had authority. He had a powerful military. That's the word for victory here. It's where we get the English brand name Nike, that power that enables one to overcome. Well, what's the power you have? What power is at your disposal? John says it is your faith in Christ. That the faith in you is greater than the victory and the power that the Roman emperor has in the affairs of the world. Jesus tells us himself, John 16, 33, I have overcome the world. You know what John is telling us? As you trust in him, that victory is played out in your life. He's overcome the world. He might have submitted to to death because of our sin, but he overcame the forces of evil. He overcame the world, and John says, in him, by faith in him, you overcome the world too. So you you remain in that faith, you continue in that, and love and obedience will flow from it. So that's a good summary of 1 John. That's what this book is all about, the importance of faith and its fruits. Let's look secondly then at the importance of faith and its object. This is where John dives deeper and says, all right, now it's not just all about faith, do you believe? But what do you believe in? Look at verse 6. He dives right in. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. Now I have to say, maybe you're thinking it too, if, if John is trying to show us how important it is that we believe the right things about Jesus, he could have been a little clearer in what he was trying to say. But I do think if we look closely, we can make sense of his language here. It's ironic that John intends for this to be proof. He presents this as evidence for why we should trust in Jesus. So when he says that Jesus came by water and blood. I think he's referring to the water of Jesus' baptism and his bloody death. And the first point he wants to make is this. Jesus didn't come by the water of baptism only. Rather, it was the same Jesus Christ that was both baptized and that died on the cross. Not by water only but water and blood. Now you're wondering, why did John have to make that point? Who would deny that? Many in John's day did. It's where the background of the letter is so helpful. The false teachers taught that at Jesus' baptism, the heavenly Christ descended upon him. That's what took place at his baptism. Jesus became the Christ. The heavenly Christ came on the man Jesus, but they taught it withdrew from him before he died. So when he was on the cross, it was just a human Jesus, devoid of this divine Christ, 
that had descended upon him. John opposes that. And he insists Jesus was already the Christ when he was baptized. You say, well, what's the evidence for that? Do you remember what John said in his gospel? John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down. This is John the Baptist. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the, Holy, excuse me, is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And John says this, I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. At his baptism, the Spirit of God came down. Not the heavenly Christ, but the Spirit of God. And what did he say? This one is Jesus Christ. This is God's Son. He's not becoming the Christ. He is the Christ. This Jesus is the Christ. Small wonder then, is it not, that John mentions the testimony of the Spirit at the end of verse 6. And it is the Spirit who testifies. Because the Spirit is the truth. The Spirit of God came down on Jesus at his baptism, and he says, this is the Son of God. This is the Christ. The same Spirit now testifies to us that that Jesus Christ died and rose again for our salvation. If you go back to the beginning of 1 John in chapter 2, he calls Jesus, who is now in heaven, the resurrected heavenly advocate, he calls him Jesus Christ. Christ. What's his point? He was the Christ at baptism. He continued to be the Christ at his death. He is the Christ at his resurrection, and he will always be the Christ as he stands at the right hand of God interceding for us. And you think, okay, well, again, why is that so significant? That was the point we made last week. If he's not human, he can't stand in your place. If he's not God, he cannot satisfy God's justice. Jesus must be God and man and one person forever, or none of us are saved. And John's point is this, the Spirit will convince you that these things are so. It goes against what we see with our eyes. It went against the natural philosophy of the day. But John's point is this, with some matters, you have to be convinced by the Spirit of God that these things are so. The Spirit and the water and the blood assure us that this is our Christ. Now, when we come to verses 7 and 8, we come into this second statement about the water and the blood that we want to clarify, but it's going to be complicated by the fact that we have two different versions of this statement in our English Bible. So in the King James and New King James Version, verses 7 and 8 have a longer phrase, a phrase that is omitted in all other translations. Let me read you the longer phrase from the New King James. It says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. So you see the differences in the longer reading You have two sets of three witnesses. You have the heavenly witnesses, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And you have the earthly witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. In the shorter reading from the translation that I gave this morning, you simply have the Spirit and the water and the blood that bear witness together. No mention of heaven and earth or a second set. Well, why do we have these differences. Which one should we follow? I, I won't go into a lot of, I don't want to be technical, especially at the end of a sermon. That's dangerous. I don't want to get too technical. But I think if we just skip over this one and make one comment, it's going to leave too many questions in your mind. Let me make a few statements on these differences here. It's the area of study known as textual criticism. It's a good area of study. In God's providence, this is a blessing, we have 6,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. Some of these are short, just a verse or two. Some of these are the entire New Testament. You won't find an ancient document that has so many copies that still exist and that are cataloged and that are 
accessible. Now, in 95% of these places, there is complete agreement. There's no difference. And we could prove every New Testament doctrine in those areas. Deity of Christ, everything John insists on, every one of those doctrines could be supported from those areas. But in some places, the manuscripts disagree. This is one of those places. Sometimes the, sometimes the disagreement is very minor. Jesus Christ versus Christ Jesus. The difference doesn't matter. It's a, it's a word order difference. Sometimes the disagreement is more noticeable. This is one of those places here in 1 John. There's only three in the entire New Testament that you'd probably really notice, and this is one of them. How do we resolve the difference? Thankfully, this is one of those areas where it's very easy to solve the difference. The longer reading that you find in the King James and the New King James Version, it is only found in eight Greek manuscripts. And remember, like I said, we have over 6,000 in existence. The longer reading is only found in eight. All of those date from a time period that is much later than when the New Testament was originally written. How did it end up in our English versions, you might ask? Most of you are probably aware of a man named Erasmus. He put together the Greek New Testament that served as the basis for the King James Version of the Scriptures. When he was putting it together, His first editions didn't contain the longer reading. His third edition did because someone supplied him with one Greek manuscript that contained it. So he put it in his third edition, and that third edition became the basis for the King James Version. He later removed it, by the way, from subsequent editions of his Greek New Testament. Why did he put it in at all? Why was there, you know, this implied pressure to include it? Well, it was very prominent in the Latin translations, and that's why it was such a popular reading in the Middle Ages. The problem, like I said, is it's not in the majority of the Greek manuscripts. The ones that contain it are very late. Furthermore, it's not in any of the ancient translations of the scriptures, the ones that emerged in the first few centuries of the church. It's never quoted by any church father. And if you think about that, what was one of the big debates in the early church? The Trinity. Now, this verse had been a part of John's original letter. And if it had been accessible to the church fathers, this would have been their go-to verse. But it's not in there. They never quote it. And they establish the Trinity instead from other verses. And so I think we have to conclude, therefore, that this was a later edition. It was probably a note written in the margin of a manuscript and then was mistakenly incorporated into the main text. But it was not part of the letter John wrote, that John wrote under inspiration. And therefore, I believe the shorter reading is correct. Before I leave that point, here's what I want to say. Many of you are probably just thinking, look, that's a lot of technical stuff. Here's my concern. Can I trust the Bible I read? Or when I go and read in the next few verses... Do I have to worry if some of those words don't belong there? Have some of those words been added in? Should some of these words been taken out? Again, I remind you, 95% of the Bible is established on a sure foundation. When it comes to notice differences you'd even notice, it's 99%. It's this verse and two other places in the New Testament where you would even notice a major difference. Those who study this topic and make these decisions, they are not interested in taking away from God's word or adding to God's word. It's a science that they're interested in because they like manuscripts. They are not satanically motivated. They are not trying to undermine your faith. Every doctrine of the Bible is established in areas where the manuscripts disagree and or agree, excuse me. And when they disagree, the disagreement is significant. So you can read your Bible with confidence that you have God's word. Here's the thing we should say, having said all that. What is John's point in referring to the three witnesses? His point is this. You have the spirit and the water and the blood, and their testimony stands or falls together. You cannot claim that you are accepting the witness of the spirit as these false teachers did, if you then reject the witness of the water and the blood. 
You cannot say, I have the Spirit, I'm following the truth, but I don't think that the same Jesus was baptized and died. You can't make that distinction and say that you are still a true believer who follows the Orthodox faith. John's point is this. The Spirit teaches us that the Son of God took on flesh, was baptized, died, and rose again for us. And that is why we have salvation. John drives that point home in verses 9 and 10, and this is where we will conclude. He says, we accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given us about his son. Whoever believes in the son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his son. John's point is in this matter, we have to accept God's testimony about Jesus. What God spoke from heaven, what the Holy Spirit was signifying when he descended upon Jesus. John, as a follower of Jesus, as a faithful eyewitness, is presenting Jesus's words and saying we must follow his testimony in order to have the true faith. John isn't afraid of human knowledge. You see that in verse 9? We accept human testimony. But there are times when God's testimony is greater. There are many areas of study that are valuable and worthwhile for Christians that I commend to you. Art, literature, science, textual criticism, if you're particularly interested. All of these are, are just wonderful areas of study for God's people. And we can learn things through these disciplines, but there are times when what we learn as humans conflicts with what God has revealed through his word. And God says when that happens, we have to follow revelation. We have to read all those other sciences through the lens of what God has revealed in his word. And I'll close with this. You think, well, that just sounds very authoritarian. That certainly sounds like, you know, a religious establishment or a so-called God telling everybody, you've got to meet me on my terms. Here's what I'll say to that. First, God being God, he could make that demand. But that is not actually the way Christianity presents God. You won't find a more accommodating God than what you find in Jesus. You say, what do you mean? In your earthly relationships, you understand there's going to be a mutual loss of independence if you're going to have a healthy relationship, especially in a marriage, but in other relationships as well. Both parties are going to say to the other, look, I'm going to adjust for you. I'm going to change for you. I'm going to sacrifice for you. If one person does all of the changing and the sacrificing and the bending, it's, and the other person does all of the ordering and the taking, it's not a healthy relationship. In fact, it can become oppressive and dangerous. Now, again, it almost seems inappropriate to say it, but in Christianity, God has adjusted to us. He has taken on flesh. And in the greatest display of humility and of love and grace, God came as a human and died in your place. One author writes, In Jesus Christ, God became a limited human being, vulnerable to suffering and death. On the cross, he submitted to our condition as sinners and died in our place to forgive us. The God who didn't owe us that, who could have destroyed us, who is the sovereign king of the universe, took on flesh so that we might be saved. That is the Jesus we love. That is the Jesus we worship. Let's pray and give thanks for him.